If I can do 10% of what he's doing, I would be retiring here in Malaysia like a king. So I thought, maybe I'm not as smart as this guy, but if I can do 10% of what he's doing, I'm set. I remember this one comment on YouTube that actually said, you're never gonna be able to speak internationally with this Ching Chong accent of yours. Like word for word. I remember within a couple of hours, it hit over a million views. This is the Content Capitalist Podcast. We talk to business owners who've used video to grow their businesses to a million dollars a year or more. How they did it, what worked, what didn't. Welcome to the Content Capitalists with your host, Ken Okazaki. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Content Capitalist Podcast, where I have conversations with real life entrepreneurs who are doing at least a million dollars in their business and producing a ton of content. Now, I've got someone really special with me today, and to me, this person is special. I'll tell you why. It's because way back when I was just getting started uh, making videos specifically for marketing, because I used to do video for other purposes, documentaries and, and things like that. But when it came to getting started in the internet marketing world, this is the guy that actually was my first client way back, I think in 2016 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I met him at a conference and immediately uh, we just got talking. Uh, Peng Jun, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining this podcast. All right, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Well, look, Peng, I think, you know, I, I've gotten videographers who write me and just like, how did you score somebody like Peng Jun? Like, how on earth did you get his attention? And I think a lot of people really look up to you because of what you've done with video. And I remember this one time we went to, uh, I think it was a, a ClickFunnels event, and you went up on stage. And I think that you lit the whole room on fire. You talked about your repurposing uh, strategy and how you take one video and you just make it go like everywhere all at once, just following a simple template, right? So I think that you've made a lot of waves in the, in the internet marketing space. But what I wanna do, if it's okay with you, is go way back to before you were producing content, before you were comfortable in front of the camera. Tell me what were you doing before the Peng Jun that we know existed? Uh -huh. So for a really long time, all I wanted to do is remain anonymous and make money online. And I think that for many people, that might be the case as well. And I know personally for me, when I first started, um, I never wanted to be doing this. This meaning podcast, live events, stages, virtual events, because that was something that was extremely uncomfortable for me. Um, and so, so all I did back then was I wanted to just, back then there was no such thing as videos. It wasn't a requirement. Um, and all you needed to do to monetize online is to have a good sales letter. And with a good sales letter, you'll be able to, with a decent offer, you'll be able to make money online. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't think that anybody would buy from me. Um, on top of that, I, I never even thought somebody would buy from a person named Ping Jun. So I created this pen name, Tony Sanders. You know that story. I basically took Tony Robbins and Colonel Sanders and I merged these two names together. <laughs> and for a really long time, uh, that was the pen name that I utilized to market digital products in the gaming space. And that's how I started. Um, all I wanted to do is to understand what's required in order to convert um, through a sales letter. But it's because of that skill set that I discovered in that journey, it eventually helped me build up my level of confidence. And that was when eventually a video became a thing. Um, that's what allowed me to initially experiment with content creation on video. So you're already pretty well versed in like what internet marketing is about by that point. And you had figured out how to do, you know, emails, copywriting, automations. And, you know, before ClickFunnels existed, you, you were probably building your own versions of funnels, right? Yes, and things was very different back then, right? Before all these different softwares, you had to learn HTML and FTP and uploading these different files and then trying to- Good times, to right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do remember that, yeah. Now, when you first started internet marketing, why did you go into gaming? And you said that was your go-to, right? Why that? Well, th that's how I started because when I first started out, I didn't think I had a strength, I didn't think I was good in anything. But from all of the digital products and eBooks that I bought at that time, they all said, oh, you got to learn how to sell something online. You got to find out what your niche is and like, what's what's a niche? Like, how do I? So so I I, I, I I remember doing some due diligence and I saw this guy called Luke Brown and apparently he made over a million dollars selling a digital product on how to teach people making gold in World of Warcraft. And I was like, a million dollars. And at that time, to me, it's like, if I can do 10% of what he's doing, 
I would be retiring here in Malaysia like a king. So I thought, maybe I'm not as smart as this guy, but if I can do 10% of what he's doing, I'm, I'm set. Um, and that's what got me started. It gave me the belief that, hey, if I can do 10% of what he's doing and sell this $7 product, um, <laughs> and that's how I started with my first ever digital product. And, and when you looked at that first product, did you have like the impression like, hey, I could do better, like I'm pretty good at this game? Well, to be fair, I came from an angle of, um, I didn't think I was a better gamer, but I felt that if if I if he, that's what he did with this product, which I didn't think was that great, I know I can definitely create better content because of what he did. Okay, that makes sense. Now, you got started, and I know that you went and took some some training for speaking, and that was that before or after you decided to put yourself on video. Man, I I wish I can show you all the files that we've moved like behind the screen, but. In that journey, I it wasn't just speaking. I, I bought everything. So back in the day when you know online courses wasn't a thing, I I bought every single training and course on not just speaking but marketing, ads, copywriting, personal development, sales, leadership. I I didn't just buy the products and the programs. I bought the upsells to the products. I bought the upsells to the upsells to the upsells. However many levels deep. Um, and but that that's what I did in order to improve and, and constantly grow. You, can you think of any particular course that you feel stood out more than the rest in case other people are looking? You, you know, how I think about my course, the courses that I bought is that however the course went, I always feel that there was something to be learned from that thing, even if it was bad. If it, even if it was bad, to me it was, well, I learned how not to do something. You know, so there's always something that was, to me, the payoff is always, in most cases, significantly more than the amount that I invested in. Oh, I get it. You know, it's, I don't know if you cook at all, but uh, the analogy that comes to mind is like, sometimes the course, I bought courses, right? And they're just like, you got to use this software and you got to go to this website. And I go there and sometimes something's missing or it's not available in my country and something goes wrong. Like, or we're going to have this celebration get together at this date, but I can't make it. And some people have this attitude like, oh, it's not going to work because of this one little thing. And I think, no, it's more like a, a recipe, right? Like if you don't have this certain type of, of flour, then get the next nearest thing. If you don't have this vegetable, you could find something similar. And the art of substituting and making it work anyway, I think that's the difference between entrepreneurs that, or, or business people in general that can make any situation succeed. Like you said, even if it's a bad course, you can get something good out of it anyway. Absolutely. Even if it's an example of what not to do when you make your own, right? Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. adaptability. And I, That's everything. I think it comes down to like coachability. Mm. Like, like I see a lot of entrepreneurs that was successful at one point in time. And you'll, you'll see that happening in the marketing space as well, where they, like 10 years ago, there was a big name. They were a big name and then eventually they kind of dropped off the radar and, and nobody heard of, you know, they're, they become kind of like irrelevant. And if you think about it, like I know some of them. And many times when they reached a level of success, their level of coachability dropped. And then they became, came from the angle of, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I really know how it works. And then, and because of that, they, they, they stopped growing. Yeah. And I think it's important for us to constantly reset and come from the angle of being that beginner again, um, so that we, just like a sponge, we can continue to absorb and, and learn and grow. So I'm gonna use that to segue into, you went from like email marketing to, uh, you took a whole bunch of courses and then you really took off on social media, you know, millions of followers on multiple platforms, putting out a whole bunch of videos. Uh, now, what was that step that that like, did you have imposter syndrome? Like, was there a big hurdle to put yourself on the camera and then the whole world can either enjoy it or make fun of you or ignore you? Right. Like those are the three options, right? I can tell you, I, I still have that till today. Till today, there are still times when I question myself when I'm about to go on stage and I'm like, wow, is is this like like just like the, just the last Funnel Hacking Live? I remember feeling that way, you know, it's like, wow, it's been like, am I really like, is this really happening? Am I going to be? And, and, and sometimes I, I catch myself doing that. And I think that that feeling never really goes away. I, I can't remember exactly if it was Mariah Carey or something, but I remember it was, either her or Celine Dion, where I read a couple of years back where supposedly that she still feels nervous before she goes on stage till today. And I take comfort in knowing that, wow, it's, it's, it's actually part of the journey um, and that 
it's it's normal, it's natural mm-hmm. that we all feel that way in that journey of creating content. I, I, I totally agree with that. And I remember there was one piece that we actually worked on together where you talked about how you didn't think people would take you seriously or people were actually making fun of you for your name and your accent when you started putting yourself online. Now, tell me about that. How did you deal with that when that happened? Like, what was the, the gut the, reaction? And then the, the what did you actually why, do? <laughs> the, the reason why I felt that way was because maybe I was a little bit traumatized from the first video that I uploaded. But I remember from the first video I uploaded, I was talking about like my goals and intentions of of utilizing video as a way to practice and eventually being on international stages. And I remember this one comment on YouTube um, that actually said, you're never gonna be able to speak internationally with this Ching Chong accent of yours. Like like word for word, that's pretty much um, what that comment said. Um, and I thought to myself like, you know, initially like th- this guy's right, you know? Um, and I looked at like the odds of that happening was extremely low. Um, but that that's why I think that's what prompted me to create that video. It was based on that comment that I got from my first video. And do you ever still get those kind of comments when you run ads, for example, or like even in oh, yeah, your I mean, socials? Oh, a hundred percent. Like, I think that when it comes to social media, social media, you know, we all know this is it can be extremely brutal. People will say things that will never that they will never say in front of your face if you were in front of them in person, but behind a keyboard behind an anonymous picture, a picture of a cat usually, um, they become like warriors, right? And, you know, so the the way I see it is that we are never in control of somebody else's experience. And it could be the case that for whatever reason, right, that when, they, when they leave this comment on how things should be different or better or how things should be or shouldn't be, it's just based on their reality or, perce- or perception of life. And it's not right or wrong. It's just the lens that they choose to put on to, to see the world. And when we understand that, that's when it's like that changes everything. And when we understand like the, first of all, I think it becomes with intention. If we can understand like the intention of why we're putting content out there, whether it's through ads, whether it's through organic, then it's going to change the way how we act or react whenever we see a comment like that. So, because mm. if the intention is to be liked, that's when it's going to be a very, very painful journey, right? Because not everybody's going to like you, right? Not everybody's going to like the way you look, the way you speak, your accent. If you want everybody around you to like you, you just have to, you know, contract your world and surround yourself with five people who like you and see nobody else. That's really the only way to do it, right? Yeah. And and, and when you, when you understand your intention, like, like if your goal or an intention is to be known, to be good at what it is that you do that that changes everything as well because then when somebody spews hate or negativity on your piece of content then it just means that it's not for them and and that's okay right it's and and they know about you (laughs) one more person that knows about you because they commented and i know that right now you've evolved a lot since you first uh started and you've been through so many different stages your business has grown really well and if i ask you with your current you know mode of operation, you're going to answer one way, but I want you to try to do your best to, you know, like when you first made your first video, was the motivation about, I need to make more money? Was it, this is scary, so I need to do it anyway? What was the motivation that made you overcome that? Because it wasn't easy, right? It wasn't your your comfort zone. You stepped way out of your comfort zone. So it must have been something pretty big. I'm curious. I'm, I'm trying hard to think about the first video that I ever uploaded. And I and I believe that if I were to go to a YouTube channel and take a look at my oldest one, it's actually a private video that I sent to uh, one of my coaches at that point in time who challenged me on creating and uploading a video to practice a specific script that she gave me at that point in time. So that was the first video I uploaded. It was to show my coach at that point in time that I actually did my homework, that I practiced in front of camera, and it was, it was weird, it was awkward. Um, but that was what my first video looked like. So the motivation was like, if I don't do this and I won't complete the course, my coach will be upset at me or or disappointed in me. So I better yeah, just do it. Yeah, that was that was that was pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, whatever it takes, right? So some people have the the toward values, some people have the you know the away from values, and uh, whatever it takes to get you to do the first one, that's amazing. And that just set off a lot of dominoes that you know that ended up in where you are now. Can you think of like a, a milestone where you felt like you were struggling 
with the online content and then something tipped the scale. And instead of pushing, like you feel like you're pushing, you kind of felt like you started getting pulled by the by the platform or your audience. I think the first time I ever felt like, whoa, wait a second, there's people actually interested in this. You probably know, know that moment because we went through that moment together. I, I believe it was in 2016 when we just shot this video um, and it was about beliefs about money. Yeah. And I remember exactly where it happened. It was at the office. And right after we shot that video together, I looked at you and I went, yeah, you can expect every video to be a home run or something, right? I, I, I remember no, you, you you told me, what? what you told me is like, no, don't use that one. That's what you told me. And I think I actually have that recorded somewhere. And I said, really? no, 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 we're, we're going to use them all because we, we made a promise to each other. And you said, fine, exactly. you're in charge or something like that. And then I, I work really hard to edit it. So I was trying to prove you wrong, actually. That was my motivation. Because uh, you were saying, that's the one you said, don't use it. And I said, okay, I'm going to prove to him that even the crappy ones are going to work at least average. <laughs> I always tell stories not based on what happened, but based on how I remember it. Mm. So <laughs> that's probably what happened. Yeah, and, and I remember after shooting that video and when you posted it, um, I remember within a couple of hours, it hit over a million views and like it eventually was more than 10 million views, right? That one. Video. I think we're and at 14 million right now on that one. 14, like, yeah. yeah and that was like, what is going on? And of course, organic on Facebook pages was still very different back then. But that was the first time I realized, oh, wow, you know, um, sometimes the pieces of content you think isn't great, right? The, when the market decides, um, it could be a totally different thing altogether. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there was a combination of a few things. There, there's one thing about that video that I watched it over and over to try to decon deconstruct, like why did this one do so well? And you're, you're a great presenter, but that video you weren't presenting. You were sharing with zero filters. And I think that the audience can feel that. And of course the topic was great too, you know? It was very controversial about your beliefs around money. People... I think we had a great hook. And I think that somehow all of the stars were aligned. It was a great hook. And then like the first few seconds of the open, somehow I guess was a good open as well. And you know, when it comes to money, I guess that's a controversial subject as well. Mm -hmm. So everybody has their own opinion about money. You know, and, and because of that, you know, it was all these different factors. Yeah, I think that what happened, this was one of those times where we spent like three days shooting and we wanted to do like 100 videos, right? And <laughs> and we were like working ourselves to the bone. And I remember like I was I was trying to be the, the videographer and the director and your cheerleader at the same time. <laughs> and and, and uh, those were those were long days. But I'll tell you what, what I remember about those is that there's just and this is so overset. There's no substitute for hard work especially if you're new at it. And when you're starting, I think a lot of people are just, they they do go through two or three videos. And they're like, oh, you know, like this is too much. Or they do two or three takes. But what you had done is committed to do three full days and shoot as much as possible. And there was no way out. And then you actually told me like, hey, don't, don't let me quit early. And a few times you did try to quit early. I'm just like, no, no, you told me don't let me quit early. And, and then we did this a few times and I just remember like you got so much better faster because you just compressed what people usually do in a year into three days. And it just that repetition, it just kept getting better and better. The analogies came and, out faster. And I think that that's the first big lesson to everybody is listening today. The first one is to really commit to taking time off in blanking out in your calendar a day of the week or a day of the month and make sure it's a non-negotiable day to set aside for content creation. In fact, today, the reason why we're doing this podcast today is because like Wednesdays is my content creation day. So whatever interview, podcast, real, short video, YouTube, tutorial, whatever it is that I need to create, I set aside Wednesdays, Wednesday evenings, um, and if required the afternoon as well for, for content creation. Yeah. And that's what we did together every couple of months where it will be like three days you know, and it was non -stop. pretty brutal, right? It was non-stop. Like non-stop, right? To kind of queue up our content for the next couple of months. Yeah. And let me ask you a real question. And if if I didn't show up, if no one showed up, but you still had it on your schedule, do you think you would have been able to, like, you would have actually committed the days and shot that many videos? I would like to think that based on my level of determination, the answer would be yes. But we all know that having somebody to, to coach you and push you and motivate you, um, does make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So um, 
I would say yes, but I think the results will be different. If it was me, I don't think I'd, I would have, like I would have done some every day, but not that many. And I, I have a, an assistant and her job, like when I need to get something done, I say, we're gonna be on a Zoom call. I don't care what you're doing, but you're not gonna let me leave till I get this thing done, whether it's writing a sales letter or email or something. You know, the, the boring stuff that I hate doing, and I'm like, you just be there. And it's, it's focus time, and I know that you're not allowed to eat lunch or take your break until I'm done, so now I feel bad for you, so I'm gonna get it done. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, like we've, we've gone through the pandemic and I know you used to do a ton of speaking events live around the world. You, you tour, you'd speak with, you know, with Gary V, with Tony Robbins, like pretty much everybody who's who pandemic shuts you down. As far as that goes, what was your, your go-to strategy? So over the last two years, we focused a lot on virtual events. We I basically took the, the different elements that worked really well on the live event and stages, and I just kind of moved everything virtually. So it was uh, virtual three-day events, half-day events, challenges. Um, if you think about it, the, there are a lot of mechanics that, that, and principles that works offline in live events, um, and we just replicated it to, to virtual events. Okay. That's what we focused on. Um, and recently, just last week, we did our first um, live event workshop again we hosted one and, and the show up rates was higher than before the when we went on lockdown so i think that live events are going to come back with a vengeance hmm. um and we're going to eventually transition to like a hybrid model yeah. so that we can have the scalability of virtual events um, and scale worldwide but also for people who prefer that live event interaction can do so and have a mix of both yeah that totally makes sense and so what locations are you doing as far as live goes? For now, I'm just going to focus on Asia. Yeah. And then when things kind of like go back to like normal, normal, um, then we'll see about, we'll, we'll explore opening up to more countries. Got it, got it. Now, there's a lot of people who have seen your ads, right? And I see that you've taken some courses that were, that you put out like years ago, and then sometimes you bring them back up again, and you've shot some new creatives for it. Could you give me kind of like a, you know, for the people who are listening who might not have heard of you, if there are any, uh, what's the, like the, give us kind of a lay of the line of what's on offer with your, with your business, the okay. courses, the agency services, if you have any, your personal like speaking gigs and things like that. So how, how I think about, um, my, my end game. So, so recently we just bought a, a 29 year old website. Uh, salesprocess.com. And that's basically our software that helps people build up their sales process. So our software helps with like email, texting, building up funnels, uh, membership sites, automations, all in one place so that person no longer needs to duct tape everything together. And how I think about that is that everything under what we do, so whether it's our events, our books, our trainings, our workshops, will be parked under salesprocess.com. So all of our offers, whether it's through our books, through our workshops, eventually it's to link that to our software. So how we run ads today and how we create content is to think about how that eventually gets a person to be aware of what a sales process is, but how do we do it in a fun, entertaining, engaging way so that whether they come through any of our verticals, whether it's through our books, whether it's through challenges, whether it's through our um, virtual events or live events, eventually it's integrated with, with our software. Got it. So that's, that's our core focus in the last year. Um, and how- And I is this live right now? Is it, is it a SaaS program? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, that is live right now. Okay. Um, and uh, well, if somebody wants to check it out, shameless plug salesprocess.com would be a place to- We'll put a link down in the show notes if you're, if you're listening to a podcast, if you're on YouTube, check the description to find that link. So this has, this is something that's a, I guess a lot of people go through different stages, right? Especially marketers. And I've seen people go from, you know, actually selling and pitching themselves and then hiring a team where they don't have to be the person. And I've seen a lot of people move into software one route or another vertical people move into is like, you know, ac acquisition companies where they're just, they acquire similar businesses and they, they grow like that. Do you see yourself evolving in that way too? To me, this this software and parking everything under that, to, to me, that's that's our core focus mm -hmm. right now. Um, I think that further down the road, like 
when I take a look at the growth of SaaS companies, once they have a, reached the level where it's like diminishing returns, that's when, like, like for example, like ClickFunnels, right? They've become a beast right now in the industry. And that's what they're doing. They're just acquiring other smaller software companies out there. And I think that's that's probably like the end game further down the road. Mm. Okay, that's very cool. Look good to hear. I'm definitely going to be keeping track of that. Now, let's circle back around to the content creation. And you said every every Wednesday you set some time aside. You told me that there's a videographer in the room too who's shooting some of this. Tell me a bit about your process. How do you think of ideas um, right. once you shoot it? Do so, you shoot so, separate um, stuff for different platforms, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So, so many things has changed ever since, you know, ever since I gave that keynote at, at Funnel Hacking talking about how I repurposed content. Um, and today, he, here's how I think about um, content. Like when, when I create content today, it is not to build up organic. It's not for followers. It is not for the views. It's not for the engagements. It's not for any of that. And the reason for that is because as I've been doing this for so many years now, I realized that the evolution of all platforms is always the same. It's always going to begin with extremely strong organic, right? We've seen that with Facebook pages, we've seen that with Instagram and now TikTok. And then eventually marketers will swallow everything and it will reach a level of saturation. And then eventually it will, it will just diminish, especially when marketers and advertisers come on board and the platforms want to begin to monetize more aggressively. So with, with that in mind, just this also means that every single platform, including TikTok, where organic is kind of strong still, is, is going to eventually become weaker over time. So what does this mean for us as marketers? Um, how I think about content creation is these few things. To me, creating a piece of content that takes a couple of hours just so that I can try to get views over the next 24 hours is a total waste of time for me. How I think about it is, so when I create a piece of short form content, whether it's TikTok or whether it's IG Reels, my goal is not for the views that I might get over the next 48 hours. Um, here's how I think about repurposing and maximizing content today. I think about it as the Reels on IG and tic or TikTok, that short form of 15 to 30 seconds is a great hook. So that means I will get inspiration from these platforms by either utilizing whatever tr thing is trending right now, whether it's a hashtag, whether it's a filter, whether it is a specific thing that's trending, right? Because that can help me get into the explore, that can help me get into the discover where I might have top of the funnel exposure where people who might not know who I am or what it is that I do become aware. Okay. But at the same time, that doesn't translate to monetization. So what it is that we do then is we recognize that that's a great hook, great open. So what we want to be able to do is then, how can we take that first piece of good, engaging, open, and turn it into something that's evergreen that lasts forever? Now, so I, that's when I think about the, the ad, because ads are evergreen, right? If, if you can spend $1 on this one ad and whenever a person goes through a funnel or a sales process, it, they're worth three, five, seven dollars. That's when it, it works for you forever, right? So, so for example, okay, so let's say right now there's this specific challenge that's trending on TikTok, okay? I might create this thing that's based on this challenge or this filter or this hashtag. And to me, whatever happens on this video is kind of irrelevant. If I get a thousand views, 10,000 views, if it happens to hit home run and reaches over a, a million views, great. But whatever the outcome is, it kind of does not matter. If it's good, great, I'll just take it as a bonus. What does matter then is I think about it splitting into three different segments, right? That's the open as a hook. And then the second part, it's like the bridge or the, the connector, okay? So to me then, all I'm thinking is, okay, so this this open, this hook that, that was great, okay? How can I connect it with a specific offer that I have? And, and usually that's done through a story, right? So for example, let's say it's like, um, there's this challenge that talks about like, trending songs called Choose Your Character, right? And it could be like different characters, right? Where, where for that few seconds, it's like five different characters, right? So to me, it's like, 
I begin with the end in mind, knowing very well, okay, if this is the offer I'm gonna be promoting, how can I have this engaging open? So it's leveraging on this song that's trending, right? I'm utilizing the five characters. And then the bridge, which is the story, is the tr kind of, think of it as kind of like the transition, right? So it, it, for example, the story could be like, after the open, I transition into the, so, these, these, these would be the five main types of marketing methods that you see is happening right now. The question is, which one are you, right? So that's mm -hmm. the second section, that's yeah. the transition, it's the bridge. And then the third section is the call to action or the offer, right? So, so now think of it as you're now able to create one piece of content that's able to leverage on all platforms, both organic and paid, but you have, there's a system for it. There's a system that helps you build up that reach, that visibility on platforms like TikTok and Instagram that may not necessarily lead to monetization, but with a process, you're able to put it into a system that allows you to create these evergreen marketing assets that's gonna work for you forever, utilizing different angles and hooks as a result of, of doing this long-term. So the, the moral of the story I think it's my dog barking over there. I think he's a little bit excited. Moral of the story is short form organic. Um, if that's all we're doing, to me, it's a total waste of time. Mm. However, if we can merge to have these best of both worlds, um, that's how we can play this game long term. Totally makes sense. And there's, I, I know you're you're a systems guy. I remember, I remember when I was at your office, right? You. You you got upset if if the binders weren't lined up properly or the stickers on the labels weren't weren't straight, and if you use this this level and guys if you're listening to this then I want you to understand that you you pretty much just got a master class on how to plan and uh, repurpose your content and I think people probably pay quite a bit to get into your your coaching sessions where you share this kind of stuff so there's a ton of value here, and one thing I do know uh, because I've seen it myself is that when paying actually implements these strategies and rolls it out then more often than not and i'd probably say nine times out of ten he's gonna make a lot of money off of it and i want to segue to like as a result because you've been creating content forever and your stuff you've probably made over ten thousand videos i don't know i don't know the number a lot uh at least a thousand i'm sure because that's how many i produce for you personally and what how does that uh like what's monetarily because people want to know that if they're gonna make all this effort how much money can they make and there's a lot of other things involved you know you actually have to have something of value to sell but what is the content like the content is that like the gateway right people taste a little bit of your personality the value you give and they come in closer and they buy something but like tell me a bit about how much your business is doing as a result of the content okay so literally as we're talking right now what I'm I'm doing is I'm logging into my Facebook ad account just to look at the the, the amount of ads we've had that utilizes this technique, and right now in this one ad account there's more than thirty thousand ads. Now, granted, there's going to, there might be some duplicates and overlaps and, and image ads as well, but this just goes to show like the power of this because this here's how how this works right now. How much money you make from this is going to be dependent on well how good your offer is, how deep your sales process is, and how well of a, of a sale, that sales process do you have, right? But if you have an offer in any type of sales process or a funnel, this just means that, no, notice what it does for you. Number one, it gives you different um, ad creatives that's gonna combat ad fatigue because of this, what, w w this angle, this methodology, um, your ad engagement is going to be significantly higher therefore it is going to bring down your cost per lead or the cost it, it takes to acquire a customer and these type of factors can literally make or break an entire business model right so because for some business models if if they are working on 20 percent margins and if this can decrease your ad cost by 30 40 50 percent that's the thing that makes all the difference so how much money you make it's going to be highly dependent on your offer, your funnel, and all of that. So while I can't put a number to it, what I can say is for us, it gives us a lot of different ways for us to split test. It, on the surface level, um, in terms of likes, engagements, right? That doesn't translate to monetization, but on the on the top of the funnel, it's 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 good for to getting discovered. Um, on top of that, 
it is a process that helps you create these different marketing assets that works for you for life. So it's hard to put a number associated yeah, to it. I get it. But that that's the thing that enabled us to scale our funnels, our offers mm. to to over eight figures. Now, Peng, I know you're a very modest guy, and you you're not you know, you don't want to be grouped in with all those people who brag about their Lambos and their gold chains. But I think it's safe to say this because you very publicly shared a poster where you had the ClickFunnels award and there was 25 out of $100 million. So, and that was about four years ago, right? That you got that award? I got that award um, right before the world went on lockdown. That was in February, 2020. Okay, yeah. So just, he's being modest, but he's doing on the low end at least 25 million. And that was years ago before the pandemic and in a lot of cases, people who knew how to do things online, their businesses went up quite drastically well. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So behind this modest face, guys, there there is a wealth of both business knowledge and uh, a lot of success. What mistake are you seeing people make when they make content? Now, there's probably some people who you respect. People have been around longer than you. But, you know, you see something and you kind of cringe, just like you got spinach between your teeth. If you just did this one thing differently, I know you'd make much more money or your videos would convert better or don't make that kind of video at all. What, what are you seeing out there in the marketplace? Here's the number one mistake that, that I believe people make when it comes to content creation is that they focus on this aspect of their business first without thinking about, well, what's the end game to doing this? So you got to actually have something to sell and how, you know, got to know how to deliver it before you start opening the doors and attracting people in. Is that what you're saying? Or at least have a, an idea to what the game plan is to be, and begin with the end in mind, right? So it's like a lot of people I see, they, they, they're like, oh man, so-and-so says I need to be doing podcasting. So-and-so says, you know, um, TikTok is the big thing. Oh, so-and-so says that I'll be doing reels because the algorithm is giving a lot of love. And then they jump onto that, that platform or that tactic. And even if they were to do well on that thing, and they get the followers, the likes, the engagements, they have no idea like what happens next. Where I call them, you know, broke influencers, where there's a lot of influencers out there. They've, they've got the following, they've got the likes, the comments, the engagements, but they don't really know how to monetize. And the way to monetize is usually through endorsements where, you know, the, a brand will approach them and say, oh, could you post this thing on your Instagram and say, this is an amazing thing and take a selfie with it and doing this post and then get paid, whatever, right? So to me, that's not a business. Pimping out your name and your brand is not a business. You want to think about, well, if I am going to be doing this thing long term, where am I sending these viewers or clicks to? Like, what, what's the purpose of this? And you got to be very clear about the reason why you're creating the content. Um, and not just doing it for the sake of likes and engagements because that's not going to mean anything. Got it. And do you think that you had your your game plan set out when you started? I don't think anybody has their, got their game plan, you know, sorted when they start. Uh, we might always think that yeah. there's this way of doing things, but... No, what I mean is you had a plan. game plan, right? Of course, it's evolved since then, but you didn't make video to get popular, right? You made video f to drive traffic or to... Or was it was it that in the beginning? You made that same mistake that you just called yourself out on. My memory is horrible and I'm genuinely trying to go back in time thinking about what I was thinking back then. Um, while you were there, do you do you remember what that thought process was? Like I, I remember you saying that uh, that you feel like you maxed out what your reach can be on Facebook and you're already running ads at the time. And in order to get to the next level, you have to dominate with video. And you said you're not comfortable in front of the camera, so you, you just want somebody to walk you through that. I don't remember you saying anything about any specific campaign. It was just like you wanted to dominate the space. Yeah, that would make sense back then. Yep. And that's just my memory too. It could be flawed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, at any point, I mean, before we met, you did make a few videos here and there, right? Uh, so if someone's like a business owner and they've got a company that's working and they know that video is going to help them, do you, when do you advise they should hire someone to help them versus learning how to control the camera and edit the videos and everything themselves? Look, every business owner should just focus on what it is that they're good at. And if that person feels that, Hey, I have no idea how to handle the tech the editing, like leave it to the pros, you know. The worst thing you can do is try to figure out these type of things where it's gonna cost you more time 
resources and, and eventually your sanity. Um, so the answer would be, yeah, just, just get people who specialize in doing that thing well to have that sorted for you. Love it. I agree. I've seen a lot of people who, uh, what's what I call the uncanny valley. Uh, you could tell they're trying to use some fancy equipment and some lights and backdrops, but it doesn't quite nail it. And it, it's one thing if you have a phone and it's very relatable, everybody knows it looks basic and nobody questions, why doesn't it look better? Why is the lighting weird? And then you have like a TV studio set, like CNN or something. And then there's all the in-betweens. And it's like, I know that guy's trying, but he kind of sucks at it. And then there's this this question, like, is this guy trying to look like CNN? Or is he just a basic, you know, dude who doesn't know what he's doing? And a lot of people fall into that. And it's a little bit cringy to watch some people try. Or, or they try to do green screen and it just looks terrible, <laughs> right? Uh, so, yeah, I do recommend, like, either, use your phone. It's super relatable. Or hire a professional. And don't try to be a, you know, unless that's your career is to be a videographer, you know, don't try to be a videographer, do, you know, run your business. I, and uh, it's, it's amazing how many people keep trying to DIY it. And it's, it's cringy to watch, right? <laughs> um, look, I, I want to respect your time and we've got to wrap this up real soon. I want to ask what is, uh, what's something that's working really well for you right now, as far as content distribution or reach or conversion? Is there something that you can give my audience a bit of a, a sneak preview or a peek into what's what's going on in your uh, you know secret labs or your factory? So when it comes to content, um, I think I'll just go a little bit deeper to what it is that we discussed earlier. So putting that strategy in place by having a process um, is crucial. If not, you know, you could drive everybody else insane, including yourself. And and the reason for that is like because there's just so many things that that needs to be done. There's a lot of moving parts, right? So on paper, that 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 it, it sounds good, but without a system or a process, um, it's gonna drive everybody nuts. So the th the thing that I will recommend is number one, put it into a system. Whether it's whether it's Trello, whether it's Monday, whether it's ClickUp, utilize some sort of software to help you and your team. Um, to see what's going on so that when, when you move from one stage to another, everybody has a bird's eye view of, of what's happening. So I will think about listing it down and I'm going to go tactical over here um, on all the different stages, right? So step number, like this has worked really, really well for us. Um, specifically, again, it's, it's both, like I don't care about the organic, but it's like how it's utilized as monetized through ads. So number one is just think about like, this is like stage one is like the idea dump, right? So this is where it could be you or your team, right? So my team does this, they see what's, what's trending on TikTok, the songs, the hashtags, the filters, and now you're just gonna dump, them, dump in all the ideas in there, the different hooks, the different angles, okay? So idea dump. Then our next one would be like, when, when you shoot it, um, you wanna think about, okay, once I shoot that video, can I link that thing to, to, to the bridge, right? What's the bridge? What's the transition? What's the story? And then like to what offer it, it's for. So like for us, we have an entire spreadsheet that does that, that shows like, okay, so this, this is the hook. We used it for th this specific funnel. And then within that spreadsheet, it will be like, um, have we have somebody from the team created the write up for the ad? And if it is for an ad, what's the live ad link? And the beauty about this is that um, and this is a little bit nuanced, but like r rather than just running as a normal dark ad post, meaning um, an ad that doesn't appear on your page, but rather it appears, you know, to a person that's being targeted, um, we want to make it as a, as a post on the page as well. Because when we run that thing as an ad, in terms of social proof, the engagements we know is going to be great. So um, having that process is really important because that's when, you'll be able to track every single piece of content that goes out, um, if it's working well, if it's not working well, if you should be doing more of that, um, and and ultimately having your editors, the content creators, the writers, you, and everybody else that might be you know, involved it, to be able to see like what's happening in, in the entire process. Okay, I love it. I've taken down a whole bunch of notes just now with you saying that because uh, I think we could apply a lot of that in our, our systems as well. Um, to wrap this up, final thing, if there's one thing you could do differently at a certain stage in your business, as far as content goes, what could you think of that you'd do differently? I would say I wished we started earlier and I wished I put in more emphasis on YouTube at the start. 
when we were work, doing this together, you know, all of our content was all purely in Facebook. And I realized that if at that point in time, we thought about, you know, optimizing it for the long term, making it on YouTube today, I know um, that all those videos that's on Facebook that has probably, you know, that that's, that's vanished, you know, because of the how the algorithm works, it would still be living today on YouTube, getting passive views, clicks, um, that would still continue work, be working as an asset if we did, you know, we made that tiny shift back then. So that would, so it would be literally for everybody that's listening um, to start your content creation journey a whole lot um, earlier. Which would, which would be now yeah. if you haven't started yet, which would be right now. <laughs> right, right now, like right after this, like shoot that video, um, no matter how horrible you might think it would be, because that's you, you, it's, that's how you learn, right? Through the true doing. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Peng Jun. And uh, guys, if you haven't done it yet, go down to the notes. There are links. Uh, oh, Peng Jun, I, I almost forgot to ask. If somebody wants to learn more from you, if they want to take a course or maybe watch some free content they have online, where's the best place for people to find uh, out how to work with you? Right, uh, so if you want to be able to see like behind the scenes what I'm doing, um, Instagram would be the place to connect. Um, I gotta con uh, admit, I'm not active enough as much as I want to be in my stories and all of that. Uh, but if you want to be able to check out what we're doing in terms of our software, you can go to salesprocess.com to see how we can help you streamline and automate like all of your different marketing in one place. I love it. I feel like that that you've said that a few times because that rolled off so so smoothly just now what you said about sales process. I actually think that might be the first time I've actually said it in the podcast. No way. Ever. No way. I feel like yeah. you rehearsed it, but but if yeah. it was the first time then I think that you you've got it locked down in your brain. You've got it locked down. Good for you. So guys, I encourage you uh Peng goes way back and uh, I'll tell you what uh he may seem like a small Asian man, but he's got a very, very powerful brain and what he does just flat out works and he's ridiculously consistent with everything, whether it's the gym, whether it's putting out videos, whether it's tracking things that are happening on of all his marketing platforms. Peng, thanks so much for coming on the show, dropping a ton of bombs. Check out the links, guys, and see what he's up to. Bye for now and I'll see you guys next time. Peng, thank you. All right, see you guys. Thank you.